Tonight we're going to look at what probably one of the, the most familiar stories in all of the Bible. And if you're were involved in church as a young kid, like and you're my age, you remember the old flannel cloth boards that teachers used to use? Well, the one that always sticks out in my memory is the one about Daniel and the lion's den. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're looking at today. You can, you can almost, uh, at least in my mind, I still see that image coming up when Miss Johnson put the, those flannel pieces up as she told the story. But what stands out to me in this chapter, uh, and really throughout the first six chapters of, of, of the book of Daniel, is his integrity, his character. Um, and it all comes from his relationship with God. The integrity of our faith and the character, our character is what keeps us standing in the midst of any kind of storm, uh, just as it did for Daniel. And so in chapter 6, we have, we have gone from the Babylonian Empire now into the Medo-Persian Empire. Belshazzar is now dead, and Darius, the, the Mede, is now, uh, now overseeing the kingdom, and the Medo-Persian Empire began. So we've passed, if you remember back in, in, in uh, chapter 2, this, this uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, we've gone from the head of gold into the chest of silver uh, as we've gone into the second kingdom. The first couple of verses talk a little bit about how the kingdom was set up. In chapter 6, verse 1, it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, and they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. Now, we're not familiar with the word satrap, but it comes from an old Persian word which means protector of the kingdom. When you read that, the word satrap, just think governor. Um, so you got 120 governors over the kingdom. The, the, it seems like the, while the Babylonians were absolute monarchs, uh, the, Darius, the, the, the Medes and Persians liked to delegate responsibilities. So just think, you got one king and 120 provincial governors. They're in charge of the whole king. Can you can't try to imagine trying to keep up with 120 different people? Well, he couldn't either. So he says over them, verse 2 says, Over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So once ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men, that's the way Daniel was described in chapter 2 after he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel is now a commissioner in the Medo-Persian Empire. He is an old man. He's in his 80s at this point in time. But it's not hard to guess what kind of leader Daniel was. And verse 3 tells us, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Well, what comprised this extraordinary, uh, this extraordinary spirit that chapter three and verse three talks about? Well, certainly he had his, the gifts that God had given to him. He had knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, according to chapter one. He had the ability to understand visions and dreams, as we saw in chapter two and in chapter five. Uh, but we also know that in addition to that, Daniel was tactful. He was respectful. He always took a reasonable approach to people and situations. But this says he had an extraordinary spirit. And this, to me, is the first ingredient of integrity. I can get the top off the pen. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Det er det, det, er det. det er det. Did Daniel ever lord his, 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 himself over anybody else? Did he ever try to promote himself, put himself up as being haughty or better than thou? And all that? No, he had none of that. He had an attitude. He had an, an excellent attitude. He had extraordinary spirit because he knew. No matter who was in charge, no matter who the king was, no matter who was appointed over him, he knew that God Almighty was the one that was sovereign over all things, over all appointments, over all disappointments. And because he was secure in God, Daniel was secure in himself. This competent, positive and cooperative attitude obviously caught the, he caught the eye of the king and he planned as it says in verse 3 to appoint him over the entire kingdom well that didn't set well with a bunch of people as verse 4 tells us then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against daniel in regard to their government affairs but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. So they were, these others were all horrified that Daniel, an old exile from a conquered country and a Hebrew on top of all that, would be promoted above all of them. Their bigotry, their prejudice, their jealousy, and I'd venture to say their downright hatred got the best of them, and so they got together and plotted together to get rid of the king. I mean, get rid of, uh, of, of, of uh, Daniel. But they could find no grounds of accusation or evidence of corruption. Look again in the first half. They found no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Why? Why was it they could not find that? Inasmuch as he was faithful. And that's the second ingredient. Is to be faithful, not only in work, but in every aspect of life. He was constantly, you know, is it rare to find somebody that's completely trustworthy in their work? Yes. Is it rare? Is it rare to find that, or is that just is that the mark of every employee? No. No, we know it's not. It's rare. It's, 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 it's rare in our day. It was rare in his day. But Daniel stood out. They looked everywhere they could. They, they trailed him. They went after him. They went and snuck around on him. They could find... They were, they were looking for anything, some kind of payola, a conflict of interest, a hint of incompetence. Man, they might have even been looking for gambling or numbers racket or any. They were looking for anything that they could, they could use to discredit him, to disqualify him, to get him thrown out. I'm glad nothing like that happens today in our day and age, <laughs> especially in our politics. <laughs> But that's what they were trying to do. But they couldn't find a speck of dirt in Daniel because he was faithful in his work. Now, Daniel was that way, but he wasn't that way just on the job. He was also that way in his personal life because the last half of verse 4 says, no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. So that's the third mark of personal, of, of, of integrity, is personal purity. An, ex, an, an excellent attitude, faithful in work, personal purity. Daniel's, Daniel's honesty remains solid and true. He tolerated absolutely no trace of hypocrisy. He had nothing to hide. He lived his life knowing he was always accountable to God. And that God, look, anybody can fool another person, can't we? 
May not be able to fool you all the time, but we can fool you at least once. Right? But can you ever fool God? Can you ever pretend to be something to somebody else? Yes. Can you pretend to be some, something else to or somebody else to God? Absolutely not. Because he focused so much on God, because he knew he was accountable to God, he grew like, God, like him in godliness. But his persecutors weren't impressed with his righteousness. Instead, it made, them, it made them even angrier. It put them off. And so they were, again, determined in their scheme to find some reason to find, have Darius disqualify him. And so they began to realize since their, their evil scheme wasn't going to work, they were going to have to hit him where he, where he was at. So they tried another tact. And they said in verse 5, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. They knew he was not going to violate God's law. So they were going to create a scenario in which, because they knew Daniel was a faithful follower of God, that was going to make him himself ineligible. So in verse 6, these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. So they cooked up, they all go together as a group, and they go in to the king. King Darius lived forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors, have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction, sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. What tactic are these conspirators using? Yeah, they're, do, they're playing out lying and using flattery. Did you notice a lie they started with? All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps. Did all of them agree to that? Maybe all of them did except one, but it wasn't all of them. <laughs> but then they, they come out with a bald-faced lie and they follow that up with sugary flattery. Oh, Darius, don't you want to be God? Why don't you establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anybody who prays to another God or bows down to another God has to be thrown in the lion's den? Now, that was too good of a... That was too good of, a, of, of an enticement for old Darius. What king of that day would not like to have ruled the religious realm as well as the political realm. And so they, he played right into his hand, their hands because he could not see past his own ego. And that's why verse 9 says, Therefore King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Now, when King Darius signed it, it's now law. According to verse 8, that law cannot be changed because the king has signed it. And what, he, what has he signed? Anybody who bows down before another god or another man other than King Darius will be thrown into the lion's den. <clears throat> well, did Daniel know about this? He may not have known what they were conspiring to, but he knew when the king signed it. Everybody did now in the kingdom. And that's why it says in verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed. So now Daniel knows you pray to another God, you're going to get thrown in the lion's den. What's Daniel going to do? Go pray. Well, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees 
three times a day praying and giving thanks before he got before his God just as he had been doing previously Daniel didn't didn't slow him down he did exactly what he's always been doing he went into his house his windows were open toward Jerusalem he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before God, just as he had been doing. In his commentary, Ronald Wallace said that he was not flaunting his prayer life. He wasn't trying to get everybody's attention. He already had all that open toward Jerusalem. Everybody knew it. He, he, he just continued to obey God rather than to obey man. That's exactly what Peter and John taught us. He said, when, when, when they told him to quit preaching, he said, we, we must do what God tells us. We're not here to obey man. And so Daniel did what he's consistently done. Now notice Daniel didn't suddenly seek God in a moment's panic. His walk with him was very consistent, just as he had been doing previously. So he continued praying and giving thanks before God. And that's the fourth ingredient for integrity. A consistent walk with God. If we wait until we're in knee-deep in water, to introduce ourselves to God and say, oh God, here I am about to drown. Please help me. It's a little bit late, isn't it? That's not what Daniel did. Daniel had did what he always did. He constantly prayed. Only a consistent walk with God would see him, see him through what was going to come next. Now, as you look at verse 10, I want you to notice some, how, how Daniel teaches us how we can have a consistent prayer life. What's the first thing you see as Daniel responded in prayer? He said it, when Daniel knew the document was signed, he first did what? He entered his house now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. He had a set place where he prayed. Didn't Jesus teach the same thing? Go into your prayer closet. Have a set place to pray. Not only to pray, but to read the Bible. A set place. Do you have a specific spot where you get up in the morning? or in the, whenever you do your quiet time, where you read the Bible and have prayer. There's something different about that place, isn't there? Now you can, you, do you have to have a set place to, read, to meet with God? No, but there's something about it when, when you do. Second thing we see is that he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day. He made prayer a habit. Habits aren't always bad. But this is, it's not just a one-time prayer. He made, he, he, he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day. Now, is there something spe special about the fact he did it three times a day? Why not five? Why not four? No, the number of times had nothing to do with it. What, what's special and what's significant is the fact that it was a regular time of prayer. Third, he had a specific position in which he prayed. This says he knelt three times a day. A prayer is more official if you kneel or if you lay prostrate on the floor or if you're standing up praying the position of the prayer means absolutely the position you're in means nothing 
But Charles Stanley once said many, many years ago, when you kneel in prayer, it minds you who's who in the relationship. The kneeling was not because it make his prayers more official. His kneeling was a fact of submission and reverence to God, that God is the Almighty and that Daniel was the inferior. And then the fourth thing was that he was... The, the, the phrase says, as he had been doing previously. He had a heart for God. Daniel didn't wait until the heat got turned up to all of a sudden start praying. Daniel constantly, consistently, continuously had an audience with God and sought after Him. And that's exactly what took place here. So Daniel's up in his room praying. He's doing it three times a day. What are the commissioners and the satraps doing? Well, they're conspiring. They knew he was going to do that. And so they were waiting for him. Verse 11, these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. They went and spied on him. And when they saw what he was doing, they went, uh-huh, that scoundrel. He's praying. They had all the evidence they needed. They burst in on Daniel mid-prayer, and then they hightailed it to the king as quick as they could. Man, you could almost taste the victory. Was, they, they could almost taste the victory in their mouth. Uh, not only did they get a chance to destroy Daniel, but obviously Daniel and, and King had some kind of a relationship that probably bordered on friendship, and they were going to see him ride on the fact that he was going to have to put his, king, his friend to be obedient to his injunction. So in verse 12, they run to the king. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? King replied, the statement is true, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. You can almost hear the glee in their voice. <laughs> Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. As soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. But these men came by agreement to the king and said, Recognize, O king, that this is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Darius his ego sought him, allowed him to seek to be worshipped as a god, but only a true god did. Now, when he found out that he was that, that, that Daniel disobeyed the law, did Darius want to throw him in the lion's den? Did Darius want to punish him? Absolutely not. He was looking for a way to get around it. They knew he was trying to get away from around it, so they used his own words against him. All day long, he kept trying to find a way to rescue Daniel. But as they kept reminding him, remember, O king, you passed this law, you signed it into, into effect. There's absolutely nothing you can do to change it. Now, I thought the king could do anything. If the king just said, well, we're going to ignore this rule, what would have happened? They would have sent him in there, too. They would have sent him in there. That's exactly <laughs> right. They would have sent him in the, king, in, in the lion's den, too. But he would have lost all authority. He would have lost all control. So he gave the orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. <coughs> so even though Daniel served King Darius with excellence, 
and Darius had planned on promoting him, he wound up, even though he was innocent and righteous and wholesome, he ended up in the lion's den. Is that fair? No. Why didn't God prevent it? Look, what, what does Psalm 512 say? I'll tell you what it says. Because I got it marked. For it is you, this is David talking to God. It is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. He's a shield for his people. Aren't shields supposed to protect them from evil? So how do you reconcile what happened to Daniel? Is God not able to be a shield? Well, it helps if we remember the purpose of a shield. A shield isn't needed in time of peace. It's only needed in time of war. A shield then doesn't exempt us from battle. It equips us for battle. So from this alone, we can, we can understand that while we might be in the midst of the fray, God will fight right beside us. Jesus said it this way when his prayer in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he was arrested. Jesus prayed, I have given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. We may be in the evil one's world, but if we belong to God, we'll never be in the evil one's hands. So, as we get back to our story in Daniel 6, Darius has looked for every way possible, any way possible, to save Daniel. But he had no other choice but to follow the law. So again, 16, the king gave orders, Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. Then listen to what Darius told Daniel. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, is that not a statement of faith? Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. That's an extraordinary statement for anybody to make, but especially for a pagan king to make. And this pagan king had just recently decided he'd be worshipped as a god too. But now he's saying, your god is greater. So, verse 7, he was put in the lion's den. Verse 17, a stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel. He sealed the ring, I mean, sealed the stone with his rings so that it would be evident if anybody tried to tamper with it. Anybody tried to get out and save Daniel. So with the seal set, and Daniel shut inside the lion's den, verse 18 tells us, the king went off to his palace, spent the night fasting. No entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He was all alone. He, didn't be, he wasn't entertained by anybody. His wives, concubines, nobody came in. He spent a horrible, long, probably the longest night of his life. He was torn apart by worry and guilt and anguish. He passed a tormented night. You've all been at times when you've been up all, all night long because of a loved one been in a hospital or an emergency room or in a situation where you didn't know what was going on. And you know how you felt. That's, that's how Darius is feeling, except even worse. He, he clearly had cared for Daniel, and he couldn't wait for the morning. Verse 19 tells us, Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near to the den, to, to da, when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. You know what he was expecting, and he was hoping what he was expecting he wouldn't find. 
The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, I don't know if Daniel, if, if Darius, if there's enough light for him to see inside there or not. My, in my mind, it was dark. He couldn't see. He was just speaking into the empty line, uh, into the lion's den, saying, please answer me. Please answer me. Please answer me. And in verse 21, Daniel did. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased, and he gave up orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. So, he knew that he had been vindicated. Daniel didn't have any problem speaking up from the bottom of the lion's den because he knew that he was innocent of all things and that God had taken care of him. So, he, as pleased as he could be, the king ordered for Daniel to come up and he found that there was absolutely no injury whatsoever, no harm at all, because he had trusted in his God. That has got to be the banner that flies over Daniel for his entire life. He trusted in his God. He did it back when he first got into captivity 80 years ago, or 65 years ago, however long it's been, when he said, we're not going to violate God's law and eat the king's food. He trusted in God when he said, give me the dream and interpret it for me. He entrusted God, his three friends trusted God in the, in the fiery furnace. All throughout his life, he trusted in his God. Now, you've all heard the saying, hell hath no, fur, no, no fury like a woman scorned. Just imagine what happens when you got a king who's been scorned, a never-to-be-duped again king. Verse 24, the king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not even reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. Well, that kind of ruins the theory that lions weren't hungry the night before. <laughs> Rather, it confirms the truth that God's judgment on those who oppose his people and his ways is absolutely certain. So before they even got to the bottom of the thing, bottom of the lion's den. Lions ate them all, crushed their bones, overpowered them, ate them all. And then what was the result? Nothing but praise. Reminiscent of Nebuchadnezzar's response to God, Darius too felt compelled to proclaim his glories as far as, as, he, far as he possibly could. Look at verse 25. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. His dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So you can almost hear the bells ringing. And just like, a bell, like the, the clang of the bells as they ring out, as, they, as, they, as, as they're coming out of the cathedrals, you hear this peal of thunder coming out of the castle. The living God is king. His indestructible kingdom will last forever. He cares for those who trust in him, so don't lose hope. 
So now what happens? Daniel's rescued. God is glorified. The king is happy. The enemy's vanquished. Can it get any better? Well, verse 28 kind of ends on a high note. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Solomon once wrote in Proverbs 28, an arrogant man stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. That's exactly what Daniel's living proof of that, is it not? But his prosperity wasn't limited to political success. He prospered because through his obedience and trust, God's glory always shone forth. And a pagan king who wanted to be a god was saved. So what does all this tell us? What lessons do we need to take out of this for today? Well, I see three practical lessons that apply to us as well as they apply to Daniel. First of all, you will seldom get what you deserve from people. So don't expect it. Secondly, you will always get what's best from God. So don't doubt it. And thirdly, your, your ability to handle both the people's worst and God's best is directly related to the consistency of your walk with God. Now remember, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den in verse 16, he had no idea what was going to happen. All he knew was he was going to be with God and God was going to be with him. He didn't know if he'd be spared. He didn't know if he was going to be crushed and eaten alive. But he knew God was with him and was not going to desert him. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown into the furnace. They said, our God's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. So while Daniel didn't know how the story was going to turn out, he was at perfect peace. Devoured or delivered, he was going to keep his trust in God because no matter the outcome, he knew that God was trustworthy. What are the odds you're going to be in a lion's den? <laughs> well, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to say they're pretty good. It may not be a literal lion's den because our lions that we, get, that, that, that we face today are called trials called sufferings. It could be financial. It could be relational. It could be physical. It could be spiritual. But we're going to be in lines then. At some point in time, we're going to be tested. And probably more than once. The question is, are you going to face it? Knowing that if you're de devoured or if you're delivered, you're still going to be consistent with your walk with God. Because that is what we know. Daniel always trusted God. He is the living God and enduring forever. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. His dominion will be forever. Questions, comments? That's the hardest part to do, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, it's easy to trust God when things are going great. But when a 60-foot wave's about to crash your boat, it's a lot, lot more difficult. That's where it becomes real. But he said, I will never leave you. I will never desert you. I will never, ever, ever. Not even for a little bit. I won't do it. 
Do you believe him? Or the proof is in the pudding. Let's close. Father God, we, we, we know the story of the lion's den so, so well that we almost take it for granted. But thanks for reminding us again of the fact that we're going to be facing our own version of a lion's den sooner or later. Some of us may be in the, in the den right now. But help us to realize that in every situation, good or bad, we can always trust you. You will never let us down. Your, 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 your kingdom and dominion rule forever and ever and ever. We can trust you because you are trustworthy. You are faithful. You are all-powerful. So, Lord, we pray that we'll respond in exactly the same way that Daniel did. But we don't wait until we get into the lion's den to do that. We just start now. So, Father, we pray for a consistent walk with you, spending time with you each day, spending time in your word, in prayer, listening to what you have to say to us, as well as listening you, you listening to our petitions. But Lord, may we be found faithful as Daniel was. May we have an excellent attitude and spirit, being faithful, being consistent in our work, trustworthy, walking with you, not as unwise, but as wise men. May we do what you told us in the Sermon on the Mount, build our house upon the rock, so that when the storms come, our house will stand. You are a faithful God, you are. And to think, you are our Father. What a blessing. Thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. To you we give all praise and glory. For this is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen.